Uh, good evening and namaskar. On behalf of Amity School of Communication, our advisor, Professor Colonel R.K. Dargan, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Pallavi Majumdar, I extend a very warm welcome to all the attendees of today's session. We also acknowledge the presence of dignitaries, worthy faculty members from NOIDA and different campuses of Amity, and also from other universities across the globe who have come all the way to listen to this uh, lecture, although it is online. Uh, we also uh, welcome uh, the most precious of all, our young students. And as you're all aware, Amity University was one of the first educational institutions which took lead in an uninterrupted, an uninterrupted learning cycle in spite of the trying times that the COVID pandemic unleashed. Under the leadership of the Chancellor, Dr. Atul Chahan, and the guidance of Vice Chancellor, Professor Balvinder Shukla, the Amity fraternity, in the true spirit laid by our founder, Dr. Ashok Chahan, rose up to the occasion and in fact created an ecosystem where we are privileged to interact with the giants of the world uh, through technology through our uh, you know in our lockdown lives and asco as you know amity school of communication is one of the topmost media training institutions in the country we are a strong team which believe in training young minds and giving them a latitude of knowledge from which they can uh, pick their own pathways uh, and as of now, uh, I would now like to introduce today's guest. Uh, it is very rare to meet a person with knowledge, humility, a large heart, an ability to mentor and encourage young followers, and last of all, have a great sense of humor. I introduce to you the esteemed guest for today's panel, Someone uh, we've been indeed very lucky to have met early this year during the ICAM conference. Uh, the house, as, as some of us know, uh, is always enamored by his magic and uh, his ability to make complex concepts seem so familiar and simple. Professor Arvind Singhal. Uh, Professor Singhal is a Samuel Shirley and Edna Holt Marston uh, Endowed Professor of Communication and Director of the Social Justice Initiative at the University of Texas at El Paso. He's also appointed as the William J. Clinton Distinguished Fellow at the Clinton School of Public Service, University of Little Rock. He is the Distinguished Visiting Professor at England School of Business and Social Sciences, Norway, and um, our you know, Chancellor's Honorary Professor at Amity University, India. Today, Professor Singhal will be sharing with us insights on Mahatma Gandhi, the topic being Mahatma is the message, what Gandhi teaches us about communication praxis. Uh, I now request uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Pallavi, to also share some of, uh, you know, a few opening remarks and initiate the conversation. Welcome, Professor Sikha and Dr. Pallavi. Thank you, Dr. Gauri. And uh, indeed, very grateful, Professor Singh, that you're here with us today on this platform. When Gandhi was assassinated, on 30th of January, 1948, he was a private citizen without wealth, property, official title, achievement, or artistic gift. And sir, I'm taking the liberty to uh, quote from you here, not a commander of armies, no sporting prowess, an unimpressive public speaker. Balding, bespeckled, brown, he was barely five feet, five inches tall. And yet, he was a giant of a man. And, you know, that brings us to, I'm sure everybody who's joined in today's panel would be very, very curious to know about why this sustained interest in the Mahatma. Mm -hmm. Why are we revisiting Gandhi after so many decades and years and days over and over again? Well, thank you, uh, Gauri and uh, Pallavi. Uh, it warms my heart uh, to reach out uh, across the oceans to all our friends who are on the call, especially, I think, uh, to the students, but aren't we all? We are all uh, students. So why this uh, sustained interest uh, in uh, the Mahatma? I, I think for me, it's been a very personal uh, quest. Uh, maybe there are some... Uh, uh, professional uh, intertwined uh, strains uh, uh, to it. Um, 
you know, when you grow up in India, the first uh, generation to be born in a free India, my parents were both uh, born pre-independence. Uh, I think you have a certain sensibility. You hear about the Rashtrapita. Uh, you know, he becomes a little familiar when you begin to call him Bapu. And you hear stories from, you know, when you take a morning walk with your grandfather, he tells you the story of how Gandhi, when, you know, there was a school inspector who was visiting, misspelled the word kettle. And, uh, you know, his teacher said, you know, this is the right way to uh, spell it. And uh, he sort of declines uh, to uh, change it. Uh, you, you become enamored. And, you know, so I think, uh, the interest in Gandhi uh, in a sort of an amorphous way uh, uh, came to me very personally. I do have some personal memories which I think are important to highlight here. Uh, in 1971, when I was uh, nine years old, I remember arriving uh, at uh, Ahmedabad the train station with my mother. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, ordinarily we take a rickshaw or we take uh, uh, tanga or, you know, uh, whatever. But this time there was a car that had come to pick us up and it was a big car with a flag on it. And I remember, you know, my mother and I sat uh, in it and it drove to Rajpavan, which is where we were staying. Uh, so I'm realizing as my mother's telling me that we are going to visit with her uncle, her Chachaji, whom I'd never seen before. You know, he was a busy man and my parents lived in West Bengal, so, uh, you know, our paths had never crossed. And uh, his name was Babu Sriman Narayan. And at that time, he was the governor of uh, Gujarat. And uh, when he was about uh, 25 years old, he uh, joined uh, Babu uh, in uh, Sevagram. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, he also is the son-in-law of uh, Jamnalal Bajaj, who you may know. Uh, gave the land uh, to Gandhiji uh, near uh, Vardha uh, so that he could start uh, Seva Gram. So here I am, I am meeting my mother's chacha, my Nanaji for the first time. And it's still early in the morning. And I, as I'm introduced to him and as I bow and touch his feet, I realize that he is sitting on the floor uh, wearing his khadi and he's uh, grinding wheat. Uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with, the, with the grinder. And later, of course, the atta that was produced uh, was made into prashad and was circulated uh, to, uh, to all of us. And it was during that visit to Ahmedabad, um, I remember first going to the Sabarmati ashram, uh, having a little conversation with my Nanaji, you know, why he's the governor, why is he sitting on the floor and why is he you know, uh, doing uh, all this. So those kinds of intriguing uh, episodes, uh, you know, happenstance, uh, which, and that was the first and the last time that I met him because he then died in a uh, heart attack uh, in a train. So I have been in some ways uh, sort of a seeker with it's easier to connect the dots in reverse. Um, but uh, I, I found myself the first time I was in Johannesburg uh, in South Africa, looking for the Empire Theater, uh, you know, where in 1906, uh, September 11th, uh, he, uh, you know, had the first uh, meeting to propose uh, Satyagraha. Uh, I remember going to the Hamidia uh, Mosque in Johannesburg, where in a cauldron, you know, they first uh, burned the passes. I think that was in 1908. Uh, with uh, Jan Smuts and the Asiatic uh, law. So I've sort of been on a pilgrimage. You know, every time in, I'm in Delhi, I like to go to Gandhi, Smriti, and Birla House, you know, the place where he uh, was shot uh, and uh, assassinated. I remember having a very a beautiful moment at uh, Peter Maritzburg uh, Station uh, in, uh, you know, this is the place where he was... Uh, um, thrown off a moving uh, train when he was 23, his first week in South Africa, and so on. So, uh, so it's a deeply personal quest, but of course, you know, as you become interested in social change, as you become interested in social mobilization, 
as you become interested in symbols, uh, you realize that here is not just, you know, a Rashtrapita or a Bapu or a Mahatma, but he was a giant of a man in terms of uh, uh, our discipline of uh, communication. Uh, also, sir, whenever I've listened to you about Gandhi, I've noticed that you've been lucky to imbibe or be introduced uh, to him in, uh, you know, in a very different way. Uh, why do you think, uh, you know, students of today, like Pallavi said, after decades, you know, uh, Gandhi will appear uh, uh, as, as somebody to understand as communication scholars, uh, with, you know, in terms of engaging with audiences. So uh, if you were to place the relevance of Gandhi today, how would you do that? Sir? Oh, uh, you know, again, I can answer this uh, question, which is a beautiful question, uh, at a very deeply uh, personal and professional level. And since you said, uh, you know, uh, for students, and let's say these are students of communication or social work or uh, uh, you know, interested in uh, social change uh, and activism. I think uh, Gandhi's life uh, is a kazana, is a, is a treasure. You know, he, uh, he represents, in my opinion, even though he wore uh, virtually no clothes and an ordinary coarse uh, dhoti made of hand spun, really a very polished uh, uh, diamond uh, in an intellectual um, frame. Um, and I think all you need to do, you know, I can answer this question in many ways, but you, you can just look at the salt march. You know, why should we be interested in Gandhi today? Uh, 1930, uh, you know, the narrative frame is salt. You say, why salt? Well, because voluntarily living like a poor man, uh, as he did to identify not with, you know, the few, uh, middle class, upper middle class lawyers or doctors or educators in Mumbai and Delhi, you know, he identifies uh, with, you know, he calls himself a farmer, uh, a weaver. And he knows that salt is one commodity that uh, the poor need more uh, than the rich. And as we know, the British taxed a whole host of things. Uh, you know, they tax tea here in the U.S. and in some ways the Boston Tea Party was... Uh, and it was Indian tea, which was uh, thrown in Boston Harbor, which led to the, you know, the revolution here in this country. So uh, Gandhi makes a very, uh, he's a lawyer, he's a very, you know, he's trained. And uh, with his experiences in South Africa, he basically writes a legal brief uh, to Lord Irvin. And the brief is the following. It says, you know, dear brother, uh, because he believed that preserving the uh, dignity of the oppressor was critical. You, know, you never put them down. Uh, you can make the injustice visible, but uh, you address them as uh, dear brother. He says, dear brother, you know, I honestly, uh, with all my heart, uh, ask you to repeal uh, the salt tax uh, in India. Because as you know, the British uh, controlled... Uh, uh, the production, the distribution, the, the manufacturing of salt and collected. So he basically said, I'd like you to repeal the salt tax because salt, you know, uh, exists uh, naturally. Uh, everybody needs it, no matter whether you're Hindu or Muslim or, you know, Brahman or Kshatriya, man or woman, young or old. Um, and so that universality of experience embodied in the salt. And then saying that salt uh, <clears throat> is uh, uh, one commodity that the poor need more than the rich. And uh, by taxing salt, uh, the British government, you know, which sort of uh, had a sense, maybe somewhat misplaced of, you know, moral righteousness, uh, that uh, by taxing salt, you're placing a differential burden, a heavier burden on the poorest of the poor. And uh, so the rhetorical frame and the argument, you know, uh, is, is beautiful. And of course, uh, Irvin is like, salt, he's gonna take us on salt, you know, let him, and what is he gonna do? And, you know, then he says, well, if, and he always disclosed his intentions in advance, no, there were no surprises. He would say, if you uh, uh, should deny uh, this, my brother, 
then I have to let you know that I'm going to walk to uh, Dundee and I'm going to, you know, uh, breach uh, this whole clause. And uh, the walk to Dundee is very carefully charted, you know, 240 miles over 400 uh, kilometers. You don't get there in a day. It's a walk. You're connected to the ground. He starts out with 78 trained satyagrahis. And, you know, over 24 days, he invites the world's media uh, to cover uh, him, the local media. And while he's walking to Dundee, there are numerous salt marches organized uh, in other localities. India has a 6,000 kilometer, uh, you know, coastal uh, line. So you can think of, uh, and this is all very beautifully. And, you know, this, the slogan, one sentence which he scribbled was, uh, I want the world's support for this fight of might against right. And, you know, he's, he's talking about the rights of 400 million uh, people. And while the salt march is ongoing, you know, the millions of charkhas, uh, the spinning wheels that are uh, spinning. And, uh, you know, then you say, well, why, why charkhas? And we know that it was, you know, very important to Gandhi, uh, you know, the notion of uh, productive labor, you know, the Indian uh, textile industries were decimated by the British with uh, the steam engine and, you know, the industrial revolution. And uh, so, you know, at least you can with dignity manufacture uh, your own uh, cloth, it was productive labor. Uh, also, uh, you know, you could wear it uh, in some ways, the cloth that you made, you could wear it uh, with uh, dignity. There were thousands of prayer meetings as he, you know, there were several times that there were the, the, uh, the, the contingent, you know, the contingent that was walking with him was two or three miles long, uh, not for all the 240 miles. And so if you wanted to make the injustice visible over 24 days with the media reporting, and you're shifting, not just the public opinion uh, in this country, in the days with no uh, TV, with no internet, uh, radio, which, you know, barely uh, existed. And um, uh, so just the, the brilliance of that approach, I mean, you know, it's a treasure. So, and I, I've just talked about uh, one little salt march, uh, you know, when the kettles uh, on coastal, in the coastal towns of India began to uh, take in seawater and were boiling seawater, uh, you know, basically the, uh, the foundations of the British empire were shaking. And it was soon thereafter that, you, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, you, you talked about uh, this entire spectacle that Gandhi created uh, during the Salt Satyagraha. And even when uh, Indian students, uh, and even in fact, internationally, uh, they study about the history of press, there is this rhetorical question that comes up, you know, who came first? Was it Gandhi the journalist or Gandhi the freedom fighter? So it was not just writings, weren't they? As in he was the editor of six publications, but his messaging was much more than what he wrote about. So his persona, would you like to elaborate a little on how he became the quintessential communicator? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, um, his persona, so, you know, uh, he goes to London, he's wearing top hats and, you know, stiff collars. Um, he comes back to India, he tries to make a career in Bombay. He uh, is shipped off to South Africa for a few weeks. You know, he's still in his uh, guard. He travels first class because he's an attorney at law. You know, he... Um, and uh, then... Uh, gradually this transformation, right? I mean, Gandhian life is uh, incremental transformation in, in the way I read it. And so if you read, you know, the story of my experiments with truth, these are just, uh, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, he, he built uh, uh, this, this persona as, as life moved on because uh, he, you know, when he was shivering in Peter Maritzburg station, uh, in a very cold night for eight hours, uh, wondering about why he was thrown out. 
uh, you know, that stirred uh, uh, something uh, in him. And, you know, I, I, it's interesting that uh, the friends of mine in South Africa, and I think somebody's written about this, who say that you gave us a lawyer, you know, a 23-year-old lawyer, and 20 years later, we gave you a Mahatma. Because, you know, by the time he returned to India in 1915, you know, he was very well uh, established as a Mahatma. And, uh, you know, personas are sort of like grands. And again, you know, you can uh, connect the dots more in uh, reverse. Uh, he, you know, authentically, I think, embodied, lived, and reinforced his persona, his brand, in his daily actions. There was complete consistency uh, between message uh, and uh, the messenger. You know, his ashram was called Seva Gram. Uh, which is selfless service. It was located in the hottest, right in the middle of India. That wasn't by accident. Uh, I mean, geographically speaking, if you look at the coordinates, but it was the hottest place uh, in India with you know, no air conditioners and coolers. There wasn't even a post office. You know, they had to set it up and so on. So he consciously cultivated this persona, not because he was being a brand publicist, uh, but because, you know, that was him, that was his incremental uh, journey, you know, a life of voluntary simplicity, you know, consistent with uh, this Hindu principle of aparigraha. Uh, it meant traveling third class. Uh, it meant uh, no unnecess unnecessary uh, expenditures, you know, hard manual labor. And, you know, I mean, Churchill in some ways was right. He was a half-naked fakir. No, I mean, yes, uh, from, from a British point of view, I mean, he got under people's skin uh, as, as uh, nobody. So I think uh, the, the key was that his persona was not directed at, uh, in, in his later life, in the last 50 years, was not directed uh, at uh, corporations or not directed at the wealthy. Uh, you know, I mean, Motilal Nehru, when he says, why are you taking my son away? You know, you've got him under your spell. And, uh, and this is, of course, referring to Jawaharlal Nehru. And uh, Gandhiji says, well, now I have him, and now I want to have you and all your family, and uh, so on. So he's a very interesting life. It's a very interesting life. And it's a life that needs to be keenly observed. And you know, I'm just beginning to do it in, in, in some ways. Yeah, but I'd like you uh, like to bring you back to the Dundee March because over those 24 days, it almost seems like this strategy which unreveals unreal itself. You know, uh, the, the people increase, uh, the, the notice of uh, journalists uh, comes into play. You know, the British don't expect that just for salt, this congregation will be of thousands. And then, you know, there's also uh, inclusivity of, you know, in the sense that women are part of it. Yes. So, so it, it's an entire community engaging. Or Hindustan, yes. you know, so Namak yes. also has that reference. It does. It does. It yes. does. So, and, and so communication, uh, you know, strategists, I think in terms of the Dundee March itself, there's so much, uh, you know, to gain on how uh, networking, for knowing that you have to invite, you know, journalists, gain oh, the attention. Absolutely. And, you know, Gandhi was, uh, uh, anytime he, well, how do you make an injustice invisible? Oh, I'm sorry. How do you make an injustice which is invisible visible? Uh, you do it by, uh, you know, inviting people uh, who are scribes, uh, you know, and so when he, at the Hamidia Mosque in Johannesburg, you know, in the cauldron, when they burnt their passes, you know, he had very carefully uh, invited uh, mm -hmm. several dozen journalists. And, uh, you know, so, because most people didn't know, you know, why, why would, you know, I mean, okay, there's the Asiatic Act, and, you know, why should they burn passes? Or, you know, when the Dundee March was happening, uh, you can imagine, no, people in Britain didn't really know, you know, that their government uh, tax salt. And, you know, it's like, why is Gandhi marching? And, you know, children are writing essays on, you know, this uh, man who's uh, marching. Why is he marching? He's taking on the might of the British Empire. And we know that, you know, the sun never set on uh, uh, 
the British Empire. And why? Why is he doing that? Because, you know, we have the audacity to tax all the rich. And what's his argument? You know, the poor need it more. So he was able to create the conditions very strategically. I mean, the Salt March was thought of. I mean, it was 60 years of work, uh, which, which came into play. And, uh, you know, his uh, Satyagraha movements in South Africa, you know, uh, from 1906 to 1914, when he left, eight years, you know, going to prison. Uh, little is known, but, you know, his, his son, Harilal, and uh, what was the name of his first one? I, anyway, his two uh, elder sons were in prison numerous times. Uh, you know, so he, there was a lot that came before uh, Dundee. Dundee was a culmination in some ways because he wanted to make, um, uh, you know, it was time in some ways uh, to, uh, he didn't feel that India was ready, but, you know, from Champaran in 1916 to 1930, you know, the conditions uh, had been laid uh, for him to go that far. But I think also in communication, we talk about who are we talking to? And you know, sure. uh, Gandhi in the sense of research, uh, right from Champaran to the Dandi and later, his research on his, uh, you know, uh, the people who follow him or the country as such, or the agenda was, we're, we're so honest. You know, he yeah. went around the country traveling just to know who are the, today we talk of fancy terms, you know, to understand who we are when we use mass communication mediums. But look at this man who, you know, really penetrates the, the country to understand the pulse of what people are thinking, to be one true. of them. True, true, yeah. And he, uh, and the train journey. Yeah. You know, the train journey yeah. where he travels with everybody else. True. No privilege, nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the favorite story that I often tell uh, is that, you know, when he was often asked, you know, why do you travel third class? Bapu, Gandhiji, why, you know, we as a country can do better. You know, the president here in the U.S. travels by something that's called Air Force One. And here's Bapu traveling uh, third class. And, you know, his response was always the same. I travel third class because, as you know, there's no fourth class. And this whole notion of the fourth class is not uh, something which is a fancy idea, uh, part of his, uh, you know, uh, magnetic persona, but it's very deep. You know, it's an understanding of Tolstoy, who he was deeply inspired by, or John Ruskin, you know, his work on Unto This Last, uh, or, you know, the work of Henry David Thoreau. He read voraciously. And, uh, you know, he loved being in prison in part because, you know, it gave him an opportunity to read uh, and so on. So this was a very, uh, a critical mind which simplified his life and simplified his ideas around a few things, but he's very consistent. Uh, and when you're consistent over a 50 year period and you're constantly on the journey of self-improvement, which he was, right? Uh, then, uh, you, you know, others around you begin to flock around you. And I think that's his ethos, you know, the credibility, the moral uh, authority, even when I was, you know, uh, planning to come into my study this morning. Oh, this is a conversation on Gandhiji. So I had to wear a white shirt, no, not a flashy red one. And I had to wear a home, home hand spun, uh, you know, uh, uh, churida just because, you know, I, I, it is Gandhi. You know? Nobody could really lie uh, to him. And I think uh, that is because of uh, uh, he being one and authentically one not just for a minute or for five minutes. Yeah, yeah so I must share with you that I, uh, that's the reason I wore homespun sari. I mean, you know, that's the reason. I could have chosen something else, but this was about Gandhi, you know. Uh, so I also want to ask you that at least when I was growing up, mm. uh, you know, I wasn't lucky uh, as you were. Uh, to me, uh, you know, there were two very diverse views of Gandhi that friends and family uh, were giving. Uh, and I really wish that at that moment, I would have been able to maybe read a text, talk to somebody who would have given me a glimpse of this person. Uh, to me, he was always enigmatic. And it's Absolutely. also when you grow in life, the Gandhian philosophy makes so much sense. 
you know it's like buddhist philosophy it starts making sense as you grow older so so for all the young audiences who are part of this conversation uh mm-hmm. if you had to recommend that you know start this journey you know to mm-hmm. me it happened because i went to seva ashram but if you had to start this journey how would you uh, you know what would be your way to uh, you know inspire them or kind of just give them like some you know some way to reach uh, this colossal philosophy okay well uh, you know i can only provide uh, my ideas and uh, i'm sure gandhi ji would have said don't just listen uh, to him but you make up uh, your own mind um so i mean if you're talking about the young people uh, i may begin by uh, i would uh, I, i would invite them to watch some uh, uh, ted talks and uh, uh, some really fine lectures uh, delivered by rama chandra guha uh, and you know he uh, i think has written uh, the two uh, the, you know the twin volume the biography of gandhi uh, gandhi before india which is 700 pages i don't know if the students will get there uh, or you know gandhi uh, years that changed the world which is after he arrived in india which is about 1100 pages i mean you know if you have the uh, i think it's a it's it puts gandhi in the time uh, that he was uh, i remember maybe as a 17 or a 18 year old uh, uh, laying my hands on uh, louis fisher's book uh, the life of uh, mahatma gandhi which really you know which is looked upon as uh, a fairly uh, important uh, piece of work because he actually spent time uh, with gandhi uh, in his uh, ashram so louis fisher fisher f i s c h uh, e r uh, uh, and uh, of and you know he himself you know the, if you want to read him you've got hind swaraj uh, came out in 1910 and you know is at least uh, a compilation of his ideas then you can read uh, the stories of my experiment with uh, uh, truth i also think uh, he becomes you could try to understand gandhi through others who've written uh, about him uh, you know mahadev desai who died very young but uh, who was very close to uh, gandhi his uh, personal uh, secretary his uh, son uh, narayan desai they've written extensively uh so i uh, you know if you just want to go the hollywood way you know richard attenborough's gandhi is 11 oscars and uh, you know he begins by saying no life can be captured on celluloid uh, in a few hours but you know it's uh, i think a very fine uh, representation in a popular sense of uh, uh, you know gandhian uh, ideas I also like uh, you know one of the people whom I work with very closely in India is Firoz Abbas Khan uh and uh, you know Firoz while he's doing uh, plays uh, you know Broadway type musicals uh, in India like Mughlai Azam and others but he made a beautiful film in my opinion called uh, Gandhi my father and uh, it won a national award it's a beautiful film because it shows the complexity of gandhi's life you know here you are father of the indian nation you know when kasturba was once asked uh, you know how many children do you have she said i have four but you know he has 400 million and uh, he had a very complex relationship with his uh, children especially his uh, first two uh, he became a father when he was 18 so i think gandhi my father shows the complexity in some ways of a man who is a mahatma but also a babu a father and how uh, you know he chooses to send somebody else to study in england uh, as opposed to his son who really wanted to go there and and so on so those would be uh, also eknath iswaran uh, he wrote a beautiful book i think it's just simply called gandhi the man i often use it uh, as a sort of a text in in my classes it's a accessible book with some beautiful stories i can go on but yeah, i think you professor singhu for sharing those uh, very interesting readings and that just uh, reminded me that uh, in terms of cultural sensibility sensibilities rajkumar tiwani's uh, you know munna bhai series uh, did oh, yeah. so well 
that uh, it seemed as if uh, the youth were able to identify with the Gandhian philosophy. Very true. You may see uh, on my left shoulder uh, Bapu uh, sitting, and you know he very much looks like the Munna Bhai uh, uh, Bapu. And I think uh, he brought Gandhi home, right, for a young generation in some ways yes. through these uh, irascible characters, right? Yes. Uh, Munna Bhai and uh, I forget the name of uh, his uh, sidekick. Uh, circuit. Circuit, exactly. And I, you know, it's, it's a brilliant movie, I think. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there was a whole movement in India with Gandhi Giri, right? And there, of course, you get into the importance of uh, writings and literature and, you know, popular culture in terms of uh, uh, the possibilities that, uh, that they, that they uh, present. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pallavi, I think there's some uh, questions that are coming. And so if you permit, can I possibly ask them? Because uh, there's this beautiful question being asked by a student. And let me just read it through. Abhishek, I'm, I'm hoping that's a student. I, forgive me if I'm wrong. Uh, was Bapu a saint who strained into politics? Or was he a politician who was perceived as a saint? Uh, yeah, these either or questions, uh, you know, uh, I, it's a beautiful question. And I wish I could say it's this or uh, that uh, it would be injustice uh, to the question for me to just say it's this or that. I, he, was, he was a life in motion. And, you know, I often use the metaphor of the charkha uh, to talk about a Gandhian uh, life because, you know, it stood on pillars, you know, pillar of humanity. Uh, a charkha has to have a very sound foundation. You know? It has two wheels and the pillar of morality and uh, morality and action, you know, and there's constant praxis uh, as the charkha moves and there's, you know, a constant churning of action and reflection. Uh, you know, as my story of my experiments with truth is an example of that. And for him, the ends and the means, uh, you know, there had to be consistency uh, there. Uh, so uh, Gandhian life, uh, even though it's so keenly observed, uh, defies a simple uh, explanation, I think. Thank you so much, sir. So there's one question by Professor Durgan. And yes. sir, is, uh, it's put in a very interesting way. Uh, so I just uh, got a call from a young friend. And as soon as he said that he's listening to you, the young friend has mentioned this. Uh, the question is that, uh, uh, you know, why is Gandhi uh, only like on, on currency notes right now? Uh, let's say, for example, there was uh, during the lockdown, the government decides to do a telecast of some old mythologicals like uh, Mahabharata. Uh, and it's a reminder of our culture, but for, for the new millennials. But why did not the state uh, think of something on Gandhi, for example? You know, uh, I think, again, a fascinating question. Yeah, I, I think, and also... Uh... Your, you know, the political sensibilities, right? I mean, he's a highly political figure. And I think in the ethos of India, and, you know, we know that uh, Gandhiji was shot by Nathuram Godse. So here's a Hindu who uh, uh, took his life and he was very inspired by certain Hindu leanings because he thought that, uh, you know, Bapu was uh, too lenient and too conciliatory uh, to, our, to his Muslim uh, brothers. And... Uh, so, uh, you know, so I, I'm not surprised in some ways that uh, the state uh, chose not to, uh, you know, uh, if I were there, I, you know, maybe I would have thought uh, otherwise, but that, you know, that doesn't preclude uh, uh, any of us, uh, you know, whether we are doing courses, I mean, we teach about this and that, you know, for us to talk about Gandhi, uh, you know, for private uh, operators to, uh, to uh, do so. So uh, I think he's, uh, he's a very misunderstood figure as well, because most of us, you know, we know him as, oh yeah, you know, somebody who did something to bring us independence. But the passage of time, uh, in some ways, uh, for me, the passage of my time, he's, he has come closer. Uh, but, you know, I think with the passage of time, for most people, he moves further away. Because, you know, the here and the now becomes more important than uh, what happened 
uh, in the past. But yeah, it's a it's a good question. And yeah. Gandhi would always say, Gandhiji would always say, forget about what the state's going to do or what, you know, is, what are you going to do? Very true, sir. So a yeah. uh, uh, faculty member, Apurva, and I think again, a very uh, interesting question. If Gandhiji were born in the digital age, uh, how he would have channelized the people to go for Swaraj 2.0? I, Apurva, I think I know Apurva. Does yes, he, do. He's the one who manages your 2.0, right? For <laughs> yeah. Great no, memory, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was the one who presided over the, the honorary professorship uh, uh, ceremony. So, yes, Apurva, I can see you uh, utter uh, that. But I don't know. I mean, the simple answer is I don't know uh, how he would do it. Whatever he'd do, he'd do it uh, uh, with uh, dignity. I mean, he. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a product of his time and uh, he was uh, driven, as I said, by uh, higher aspirations for himself as a person. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the Mahatma will still be the message, you know, and we know his, the complexity of his whole life when he was asked, you know, Papu, what message do you have for the world? He said, no message. No, my life is my message. And I think however that translates uh, to uh, Swaraj uh, 2.0 uh, would, be, would be interesting. But here it's important, you know, for us to make, I and mean, as I read uh, Gandhi, uh, and, you know, before him was Tilak, right? And Tilak, you know, uh, based in Pune, uh, edited uh, uh, Kesari, uh, the, uh, the, the publication. And Swaraj for Tilak, as he talked about it, was uh, home rule, you know, was uh, freedom from uh, uh, the British. I think for Gandhi, Swaraj was more Swaraj, uh, mm. rule over self. And uh, it's an important uh, uh, distinction. I mean, he was, he was for home rule, but before he said home rule, we should be worthy of home rule. And in order to be worthy, uh, you have to rule over yourself. And if you are a believer in Satyagraha, and if you are a believer in Ahimsa, you need a daily discipline to rule over yourself. So the charkha spinning or the grinding of the yata may be a, menial, boring task, but that is how you purify yourself to be worthy of Swarajya. So it, it, it's really interesting. So Gandhian sensibilities would come into play, uh, Apurva, I think, uh, for a 2.0 version. Okay, Professor Singhal has another interesting question from a colleague, uh, Rubed, uh, would like to um, uh, ask you that if you were to ask Gandhi one question, what would it be? <laughs> you know, uh, it was, it's interesting. Uh, when Barack Obama became president in uh, 2009, and he was visiting a school uh, in Arlington, uh, Virginia, a ninth grader asked him a question. Her name was Lily. And she said, uh, Mr. President, uh, if you had the choice of having dinner with one person, dead or alive, whom you could bring into the White House and, you know, uh, who would it be? And uh, Mr. President Obama, you know, without batting an eyelid, he said, of course, it'll be Gandhi. It'll be Mahatma Gandhi. And then, of course, he says, uh, I, I know it's going to be a very small and simple meal. Uh, so anyway, so this is a good question. What question would I ask him? I, I think the question I would ask him is, what's the question that we... Uh, should ask ourselves as we as we uh, journey in our own lives and I, i'd be very uh, he probably won't answer it it's so you'd have to go discover it uh, for uh, yourself but yeah i'd like to uh, but i think he would respect the question and he uh, so my question would be what question do you think a person like me should be asking, but I'm quite sure he won't answer it. That's a tough which question. Which is an answer, which is an answer, right? Right. 
And Pallavi, we have a question from Dr. Ruchita Chaudhary, and she's from Lucknow. And so oh, yeah. she's asking uh, how Gandhiji's educational philosophy is relevant in today's world. You know, at, at a fundamental philosophical level, uh, you know, I, I think he's so vital and important. So, you know, the reason why he bought his Phoenix farm uh, in, in Durban, 1901 or two, I can't remember. I've been to the Phoenix farm in Durban where in 1903 he started uh, the Indian opinion. The reason was because uh, as... Uh, uh, you know, he was getting involved in, let's say, uh, appeals and petitions uh, and so on. Uh, he felt that, uh, you know, for his own growing children and uh, uh, other children of, you know, the sort of the would-be satyagrahis, uh, there uh, wasn't uh, a place for them to, you know, in a very white South Africa. And, uh, and so the Phoenix Farm, in, you know, in some ways was uh, education, right, uh, for... Uh, the uninitiated. So you worked, you know, you woke up at a certain time and you worked in the fields with your bare hands and you know, then you had instruction and Gandhi was often the instructor. And uh, so it was very practical, uh, you know. Uh, so I think he was for education, but he was for education of a somewhat different kind. I think for him, the notion of uh, not just cultivating habits of the head, right, uh, which is what education I think mostly is uh, in, in these days, especially in institutions of higher learning. You know, I think Amity has a wonderful focus on going beyond that. Um, uh, and uh, we, we need that, right? Uh, you also have to create the conditions as his holiness, the Dalai Lama, who loved Gandhiji would say that you also have to have institutions of, you know, higher learning or schools that also cultivate habits of the heart. Uh, cultivate habits of the spirit and habits of the body. So I think uh, Gandhi is very, very relevant. We have moved on though, right? I mean, we, we think that, you know, unless you have a paper and a pen and unless you have a computer and a screen, uh, you know, uh, and unless you can solve problems, uh, I think he was more for a more holistic uh, sense of education and uh, uh, it, so he challenges us, I think, you know, are we educating ourselves in terms of what we know or, you know, is that uh, it's for him, it's not information driven. It's more wisdom, which comes from within, which only can come if you cultivate uh, these various uh, habits. I mean, it's that journey, right? We sent you a lawyer, a trained lawyer from London and we give you a Mahatma. How do you become a Mahatma? You don't become a Mahatma by going to school in the traditional sense. So and if I'm correct, um, he visited Shanti Niketan, isn't it? If I'm correct. I, I believe so, yes, he yeah. did. And, and his know. relationship with Tagore has so much, you know, in terms of this whole educational uh, praxis, you know, the, the delivery. To me, uh, what you feel for Gandhi, I've always felt for Tagore. And, you know, uh, when the, you know, it's like this dynamism and they, to meet whenever they meet. You know, the conversation yeah. that takes place, the text that you read is just incredible. Yeah. But I think, Gauri, another related question, since we are talking about education, is that how can the Gandhian model of communication be used to uh, educate people regarding sanitation and hygiene, especially uh, amongst the underprivileged during this COVID-19 pandemic? What are the key principles that we can learn from uh, Gandhi's approach? Well, you know, the symbol of uh, the Swachita campaign in India is Gandhiji's Anak, and rightly so. You know, the first time he attended a meeting of the Congress uh, working party, you know, in the morning he was discovered uh, cleaning uh, toilets, and that was you know, and that was a sort of a daily habit. And, you know, cleanliness is next to uh, godliness. So uh, he, he exemplified uh, that. And uh, I'm not sure who cleaned the toilets in uh, Raj Bhavan in Ahmedabad. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, probably, or, you know, how many of us clean our own uh, toilets? 
so I think it's again a, you know that question can be asked of uh, each of us: uh, How far are we willing to go ourselves? And uh, uh, it's and you know it's easy to say uh, what meaning does this have uh, for? Uh, but I think it really begins here. You know, there's a beautiful story. It wasn't. It's not a Gandhian story, but I often share that uh, in some of my classes, and I say that. You know, imagine a 70-year-old man or a woman reflecting back uh, on his uh, or her life and, you know, begins by saying, when I was 20 years old, I wanted to change the world. You know, that's who we are, you know. And by the time I was 30, I realized that the world was too big a place, too complex a place for me to try to change. So, you know, I'll just work on my country. And, you know, then by the time I'm, I'm 40, you know, I realized that my country, oh, Lord, you know, India, U.S., too big, too complex a place to try to change. So let me work on my city. And you know, then by the time 50, it's like my city, <sighs> Delhi, you know, oh, Lord, El Paso, ah, you know, uh, so maybe I should work on my neighborhood. And you know, then by the time you're 60, it's like my neighborhood, you know, places that I know, people who I know, very complex, very difficult. So maybe I should work on my family. And then by the time you're 70 years old, you realize that family, people whom you know, most intransigent people uh, that you could have. So then you realize, ah, maybe I should work on myself. And then you begin to flip that story. You know, what happens when you begin to work on yourself at 20, cleaning the toilets? Uh, you know, maybe by the time you're 30, people in your family, yeah, by the time you're 40, people in your neighborhood. So it's a long journey. And I think a question such as this, which is deeply uh, important, defies a simple answer. Because as Gandhiji would say, where are you in the picture? Very true. So Pallavi, maybe I'll combine two questions. Uh, so uh, we have the head of the English department uh, conveying her gratitude to you. Uh, you know, uh, she's uh, really enamored and a uh, lot of takeaways. And there are two questions which I'm combining. Akorade Ajibade, forgive me if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, uh, uh, is asking what inspires you the most about Gandhiji's story and lifestyle? And Pankaj Rakesh is asking lots of debate over Gandhiji's relevance in today's Kaliyuga of politics. Is his spirit of Ahimsa still relevant? So if you'd like to maybe talk about both in one yeah. comprehensive way. So first, uh, Akwarade is Corey. Uh, she, I work for her. She's here at the University of Texas at El Paso. She's from Nigeria. And Corey, I'm so glad you're on the call. And Pankaji, thank you also. There's so many stories. I think Corey likes to hear stories. Uh, when she took my positive deviance class this fall, she was forever encouraging me to tell uh, story. So I think she's asking what stories inspire me. So I don't know if I've told you this story, Corey, this is the story of uh, Gandhiji. This is later on in his life when he's, you know, Mahatma and Rashpita and all that. Uh, just a few uh, weeks uh, before he was assassinated, when a woman came in prayer meeting and said, Bapu, tell my, uh, you know, four-year-old uh, to stop eating sugar. And, you know, Bapu is like, oh, do you like to eat sugar? He says, yes. And she's, okay, sister, come back after a week. And, you know, she's like, come back after a week. Well, anyway, you come back after a week. She comes back after a week. And then Bapu says, oh, yeah, well, yes. And then he tells the little kid, you know, tomorrow try to eat just a little less sugar than you are eating now. And the day after that, try a little less. And the woman said, but Bapu, you could have told him exactly the same thing a week ago, right? And she, said, yeah, you're right, my sister, I could have, but uh, what you don't know is I also have a little sweet tooth. And first I had to see if it was possible uh, to cut it down. And I, I have in the last week discovered that yes, you can uh, cut it down a little bit at a time. Here's a Mahatma talking to a four-year-old. And look at the consistency between the message and the messenger. And that's what made him Mahatma, right? Bapu. And for him, it came naturally that you don't advise anybody to do anything unless you can do it yourself. And look at the way we behave, right? We know how to solve all the problems of the world. 
uh, without really deeply questioning where are we in the picture. And I think uh, um, my favorite story though, Corey, this is for you and also for those who are tuning in is, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, Louis Fisher's book uh, has many beautiful stories, but there's one. Uh, he talks about how he's sitting with uh, Bapu, you know, Sabarmati and uh, Bapu is spinning his charka. And, you know, he was very punctual. He, in fact, if you go to uh, Birla House uh, on East January Lane, you can see Bapu's watch, right? Which stopped at 5.17 p.m. He yeah. always carried a watch and he was late for that prayer meeting when he was assassinated. So Fisher talks about, you know, Bapu is spinning his charka, suddenly looks at his uh, watch and he says, Fisher, it's time. And he says, oh yes, Bapu Mohan. He called him Mohan. Mohan, it's time for us to go serve. You know, so at the ashram, they were responsible for serving food. And after you've served, then you get a chance to eat. So Bapu is sitting with Fisher. And, uh, you know, somebody comes and puts a little rice and, you know, puts it on Bapu's plate and puts it on Fisher's plate. And then somebody comes and puts a little dal. And, you know, then somebody comes and puts a little vegetables and yogurt. And when they are putting vegetables on Fisher's plate, Fisher puts his hand up. And this is the conversation uh, that happens. And, you know, I've sort of told this story so many times that I don't even need to look into uh, Fisher's book. So when Fisher's hand goes up, Bapu says, Fisher, you don't like vegetables? And there's a pause and Fisher says, Mohan, not the same mishmash of gourd and beans and boiled vegetables three days in a row. And then there's a little pause and Bapu uh, says, uh, Fisher, add some salt, you know? add some nibu. And there's a long pause and uh, Fisher says, and kill the taste. You know, they had a bantering relationship. You want me to kill the taste by adding uh, salt and uh, nimbu? And Gandhi, uh, you know, after a pause says, no, no, not kill it. Enhance it. Enhance it, Fisher. And then there's a long pause and Fisher says, Mohan, you are so nonviolent in your creed that you don't even want to kill taste. And there's a long pause and Bapu says, Fisher, if taste were the only thing that humans could kill, I would be okay with that. And so, you know, this is a deeply, uh, it's, it's a beautiful story because it's a conversation uh, between an American journalist and the Mahatma. And uh, this story is in the here and the now where they are both fully present. And uh, they are, and Babu had a wonderful sense of humor, right? You know, all this banter about, yeah, yeah, you know, not kill it, enhance it, you know, dalo thoda mirch masala, right? As uh, he would say. Uh, and Pankajji's question, you know, I, again, I think we, uh, it's, uh, I don't think Gandhi uh, uh, lends himself uh, uh, as an, I, I think he's deeply, deeply relevant if we choose to make him relevant. And, uh, and, and, you know, the picture is not somebody else should make him relevant. The question always is in the here and the now, how can I make him relevant in my life? Yeah. Well, like I said, I'll be the bad timekeeper. Uh, and uh, so, uh, whether we meet you in person or we hear you online, uh, you know, it just, one wants to listen to you. And every time you speak, there's some takeaway, you know, it's like, I need to do this now. This is where I went wrong. It's like this introspection through Gandhi that one sees. Uh, we are really blessed to have you uh, amongst us. And I will take this opportunity uh, to invite uh, Pooja Chauhan, ma'am. Uh, ma'am has been on the webinar uh, listening. And um, uh, ma'am, uh, welcome to the webinar. I know that you were there and you've been listening to Arvindji. Uh, please, ma'am, it'll be our honor if you could give uh, you know, a befitting end to this conversation. And really nice to see you, ma'am. Gauri, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
Professor Singhal, welcome back to Amity. And last time you were there with us on campus. Um, and I can just remember the enthralling keynote address that you gave us. It was mesmerizing. And um, we've attended, we've had a lot of conferences, we've had a lot of keynote speakers, but very rarely have we seen somebody jump off the stage and come and walk amongst the students into the aisles of the auditorium. And I really want to tell all our Amityans listening today, faculty, students, everyone, that that is the passion that Professor Singer has. He's, he's really a passionate person. And during this one past lovely one hour, we could all see that with what uh, passion he is researched on this great person, Mahatma Gandhi. And I once again welcome you, Professor Arvin Singhal, and thank you so much for being here with all of us today. I also want to tell one or two very quick things. Pallavi and Gauri, you're very happy. I know that uh, you've always wanted Professor Singhal to speak to our students. But last time when we met him, um, I think he had come a day after or maybe two days later, and we were very privileged that he had accepted our honorary professorship. But few things that I noticed that when he came back, he remembered the name of each and every person, each and every faculty member, the students who were with him. And that is, that is something that all of us need to learn. So Professor Singer, that apart from your great research, your thorough knowledge, Anna, your vivacious reader that you are, but there are so many qualities that you have. And with the, with the kind of uh, words that you've used today, one can only see that you yourself are so passionate about social justice, social work, upliftment of the poor. So once again, we are very grateful. Thank you so much for being here. And hopefully uh, things may pass and we are again uh, able to welcome you back on campus. Thank you so much, Professor Singer. I once again uh, thank you on behalf of our founder president, Dr. Shoke Chahan, our chairperson, Dr. Mrs. Amita Chahan, and our chancellor, Dr. Atul Chahan. Thank you, and it is really lovely to see you again. Thank, thank you. you so much, ma'am. So. Thank you, Pooja ji. Yeah, I, just uh, to say that uh, uh, in, in many ways, when I visited uh, m and I uh, felt uh, uh, this, uh, connection of the heart spirit yeah the mind is uh, okay and uh, i think uh, in this conversation as in the conversations that we've had in the past and the conversations we'd have in the future uh, there's a degree of mutual respect for the service uh, that uh, we are here to do as you know educators as provocateurs as uh, people who can maybe stimulate uh, a little change in heart or mind or spirit. So thank you. I'm deeply honored. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, uh, I wanted to also place on record uh, the gratitude to Dibjani. Thank you, Dibjani, for doing the backing work. Uh, our regards to Professor Colonel R.K. Dargan, who is sitting, uh, you know, I'm imagining uh, physically listening to the lecture, to all the faculty members. And uh, sir, like ma'am has said, uh, Amity has a deep relationship with you. We feel it from our hearts and we wish to see you again soon. Uh, and so a lot of gratitude from us. And Pallavi, if you'd like to give some closing. Uh, Gauri, before you end, uh, of course, I want to appreciate both of you for getting such a stalwart again. And um, Professor Singhal, our, our work is still pending. I remember last time you had so um, uh, spoken to us about classroom teaching and how that is an area of your interest now, that how uh, learning and teaching should be, um, should really have the outcome. And as educators, I remember that we had really spoken at length about this. And Pallavi and Gauri, on, on your behalf, I would, I would once again request Professor Singer that if he maybe can address our faculty and teachers on this topic, because he, he's, he's really an amazing person who's done so much work on how teachers should be able to teach in a way that, it, that it's translated well to students. So I would really request that he, he can give uh, another session for our teachers, both at school. I think our chairperson would really like that um, and, and university across that how classroom teaching can really be optimum. 
I accept. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja Ma'am, for your gracious presence and uh, for your thoughtful words. And for the single, as Pooja Ma'am pointed out, your uh, positively deviant uh, sessions are very, very inspiring. And uh, you know, not just takeaways um, for the faculty, but I'm sure uh, you know when faculty invite some of these lessons, they will be able to transmit a lot of that approach to the students. So looking forward to having you back with us very, very soon. Thank you so much. And thank Thanks. you to all the participants for, uh, you know, a great response. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you.